Welcome to Emerging Languages Camp 2010. Parrot by Allison Randall. So, um, my real job is chief architect of the Parrot virtual machine, but I've been known to moonlight in other things like running publishing companies or open source conferences. So, you've probably heard of Parrot. Um, it's, it's one of the earliest implementations, at least in the modern era, of a dynamic virtual machine that's intended to target multiple languages. Um, we do monthly developer releases and quarterly stable releases. Uh, the most recent was the 2.6 release, which was just yesterday. Um, now, when we started the Parrot virtual machine, people told us we were absolutely crazy. Uh, dynamic languages didn't need a virtual uh, de dedicated virtual machine. They didn't need to be optimized. They couldn't be optimized. Um, since that time, and it's been about 10 years now, uh, it's actually become quite common. And you'll see the major virtual machines like JVM or .NET now proudly supporting dynamic languages, multiple dynamic languages, and, and other players are entering the game now as well, um, adding support for multiple languages. So it, it's kind of a good feeling to think that we inspired a movement um, by going out there and doing something completely crazy. So I say that uh, dynamic multilingual virtual machines are common, and it's true, but Parrot has some fairly unique features. Um, one of them is it has no stack. It is instead register-based for variables, for passing variables. Uh, but not in the sense of a single global register set like you'd find on hardware. Instead, it has local register sets for each. Uh, it's a scope, it's basically the size of a subroutine. So each subroutine has its own local register sets, which is good for safety, good for concurrency. It, instead of using the stack for control flow, it uses something known as continuation passing style. So where you would ordinarily push a return address onto the stack and then pop it off again when you're ready to return, in this case, you capture a continuation at the point where you make the call, actually just after you make the call, and you pass that continuation object into your call, and when you're ready to return, you invoke that continuation. Um, this also has some advantages for stability, avoiding stack smashing, um, and a certain amount of uh, encapsulation in that your return is an object rather than a raw address. So Parrot has a native assembly language which is object oriented. Um, it's perhaps its best feature is the compiler tools uh, which are which include a uh, parsing expression grammar uh, like a grammar engine. This is sort of the modern version of parsing engines. It does not include pack wrap um, optimizations for caching uh, the parsed, parsed elements. And from the parser, it then has a series of tree transformations to produce the actual code that runs on the virtual machine. Uh, we've, we've found this is a very easy to use dynamic system. It's familiar to anyone. The syntax is very regular expression-like, so it's familiar to anyone who's used regular expressions. It's, uh, the tree transformations were heavily inspired by Don Knuth's at attribute grammars, although many generations later, so you can, you can imagine there are significant changes to the idea. But that's not actually what I want to talk to you about. Uh, so what I want to talk to you about is the next step. So in the next two quarterly cycles, uh, 2.9 and 3.0, 3.0 will be next January, we're focusing on something that we've codenamed Lurido. Uh, Lurido means small parrot in Spanish. And the idea is a, a smaller, lighter, faster virtual machine. Um, so in the past 10 years, we've had substantial opportunities to learn from uh, our implementation, uh, our early design goals, and um, so we're taking a step back now to reconsider our earliest design, um, our earliest decisions, and how that might, you know, in light of what we've learned, how that might change, and how we might uh, refactor the existing virtual machine, uh, either piecewise or by some substantial replacements, 
to be closer to what our ideal would be now that we've learned 10 years of lessons. So one of those things is fast startup time. We're pretty good now, but we could be substantially better. Uh, resource consumption, lower memory. Um, with an idea of targeting cloud architectures, uh, mobile architectures, where you need very small, very fast, very light implementations. And then to provide that, that core, that fast core, to all the languages that we currently support and other languages that could eventually be implemented on that machine. So I'm just going to go through a few of the changes. Um, one of them is a microcode approach. So Parrot currently, uh, this was based on the original architect's design, it wasn't me, I, could, I won't take the blame for that one, was a monolithic opcode approach. Um, essentially the idea that opcodes are cheap, we can have as many of them as we want, no problem. So we have over 1,200 opcodes, and this is just the static opcodes, not the dynamically loadable opcode libraries. Yeah, it, it can, it's a little bit painful, especially when you go to write a JIT. Um, the new, sorry, I wasn't planning on presenting on this laptop. Uh, the new uh, virtual machine, which is currently implemented as a prototype, has 20 opcodes. It's a substantial jump. So that's the lowest level of the microcode, uh, microcode zero. The higher levels of microcode are all composed from that lower, le lower level of microcode. So this is an advantage for jitting in that you need C templates for the lowest level, these, the N0 level, um, and then you compose the C templates for the higher levels from C templates or LLVM templates or whatever you decide to use for your JIT. You only have to do it for those 20, maybe 30, once we get finished with it, um, opcodes, and then everything else gets built up from there. The, the highest level of the com composed opcodes is our current assembly language. Um, so ultimately, the entire assembly language, the native language, and the bytecode of the system will be composed of a very small set of opcodes. Another thing that we're re-examining is garbage collection. Um, so we're going for concurrent copying compacting garbage collection from the start. Uh, the original implementation did not have relocatable objects, which is a substantial problem once you start to move to more advanced modern garbage collection systems. Our object system is another thing that we're going to be re-examining. Um, through an accident of history, our, our current object system has two completely separate branches. So you have objects that are implemented in C, and you have objects that are implemented in the assembly language, or some higher level language, but compiled down to assembly language. Um, and with um, what we call the inferior run loop problem, it's essentially when you're crossing over the barrier from executing uh, opcode, uh, level, the opcode level run loop down to the C level run loop because the virtual machine is written in C underneath, you, you end up having substantial problems crossing back and forth, especially if you cross back and forth multiple times and you end up kind of messing up your, your C stack in the low level virtual machine. So the, the movement in Laredo is towards unifying uh, these object systems so that we have only one object system and it's only in uh, the superior run loop, only in the uh, assembly language level. And therefore, all objects are jittable automatically um, and we don't have the cost of crossing back and forth over that C and, and virtual machine layer. From there, um, open possibilities. We will re-examine every single subsystem. Um, there are scattered, I mean, there are scattered lessons that we've learned throughout the entire virtual machine, um, ways that we can improve it, and this is a fantastic opportunity to do that without disrupting anyone who's using the current stable supported Parrot. Um, and that's it. Any questions?
Python Perl, oh, sorry, what dynamic languages currently run on Parrot is the question. Python Perl 6, not Perl 5. Uh, PHP, you know, the Ruby implementation needs help. I actually just got an interesting idea from Charles Nutter that I'm going to try exploring next month. Um, and then a bunch of other languages like BF and OOK and, and, you know, like this whole, there's this whole long tail fun and, yeah, there's a long tail of, of languages. Uh, CLISP, Scheme, um, basically any language that, that someone has thought, hey, it'd be fun to try out doing an implementation of this. Like we, we have that. We don't have Java, although we do have a bytecode translator for Java. Um, so it's it's a mixed bag. Uh, the ones we're really targeting I are those those first four, uh, the the P languages. Yeah. Um. So the best the best illustration I can give you. Um, is uh, Patrick Michaud, who's right now giving a talk on Perl 6 in another room, um, decided to uh, give a Python talk for PyCon a few years back. And for this talk, he wanted to demonstrate Python running on, on Parrot. But as often happens, he didn't actually get around to writing the talk until the night before. <laughs> so he sat down, and in four hours, he knocked out about 80% of the core syntax of CPython. Now, th that's not, you know, the longer bits, you know, the harder bits, but still. Um, a lot of that has to do with the, the parsing expression grammar, you know, the, the sort of regular expression-like syntax, and then uh, the other parts of the compiler tools. Uh, well, I mean, Partly, partly, um, partly it depends on how similar your object model is to Parrot's. Like Perl, Python, PHP, Ruby, their object models are pretty similar. And Parrot's object model is designed to provide that. From there, you end up subclassing the core object model and adding features or masking features that you don't want. Um, so fairly rapidly, but the, the farther you diverge from those languages, the more likely you are. If you want, you can just create your own object model and drop it in. Um, and that, you know, I can't predict how much work that is because it depends on like how many how many class methods your system supports and um, sort of how unusual your dispatch mechanism is. But we do provide the overridable hooks for all of that. So you know, like if you want to override dispatch, there's just one vtable function find method. You override that in your class object and. It's, it's taken care of for the whole system. So you're not really implementing it from scratch. You're just extending. Yeah. At the moment, it's a simple C switch because we did a fast prototype. Oh, what kind of instructions? Oh, OK. Um, so like add, subtract, you know, the math and basic math instructions, uh, basic comparisons. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty much all of it. And then then you have things like allocate a block of memory and access a a value at a particular block of memory, which is sort of like the base level of the object system. Uh, so the object system is composed from those primitives. Mm, I don't know who's had their hand up longest. I think. You just. Just that the Ruby implementation, the uh, implementers abandoned it, so it's not actively maintained at the moment. Um, but Charles is working on something I think he's going to talk about later that we might use for that to re-jump start it. Very well. Uh, there's an implementation of CLISP and Scheme. Um, now, part of it is is a bit of an emulation. Uh, your your lambdas are objects in in Parrot, but 
you can, you can it, a lot of it has to do with simply not exposing a lot of the features of Parrot. Um, and you can do that through, you know, your, since you only expose your syntax, then if your syntax doesn't allow access to certain features of Parrot, then it, it's, it's completely hidden. And yet, your functional language can interact smoothly with object-oriented procedural languages as well. So the core virtual machine is quite fast. Uh, we benchmarked it at about 10 times faster than CPython uh, or CRuby. But because we don't provide any kind of jitting currently, we ripped out the current, the current JIT uh, as a, a precursor to our refactors. Um, user code on top of it can be slow, uh, particularly the compiler tools are slow, at least what I would call slow. Uh, much slower than we want them to be. Uh, so that's one of the reasons for going for this refactor is, is not, not so much for the co core virtual machine, but to give the users as much assistance, automated assistance as we possibly can in having fast code themselves. It does provide support for concurrency. It currently has a, um, it, it currently is just using POSIX threads and Windows threads underneath the hood, but it provides an abstraction layer above that. Um, it's, it's a very simple concurrency model, and there's a lot I would like to do in terms of thread level speculation that we, we haven't gotten to yet. No, I have philosoph philosophical objections to CSP. <laughs> but someone could, if you want to, go for it. So we've actually talked about combining Parrot with LLVM, with the um, LLVM team. Chris Latner is a friend of mine from, from Portland. Um, so the difference is LLVM is static languages, low level, and Parrot is dynamic language tools. Um, so the combination would be using Parrot for the parsing, for the dynamic uh, compilation layer, and then having LLVM underneath for the, the raw uh, implementation and jitting. Probably one more question. They do, they do talk now. You can run, um, there, there's, there's tests in the system to make sure that our implementations um, are, are unified to the extent that you can call a Python object from within uh, Perl code. How much that continues to be will depend on the language implementers. We've kind of, we've come to the conclusion that that may not be as much of adva an advantage as we thought it was. But to the extent that it doesn't cost us anything, we'll continue to maintain it. I think that's all the time we have, sorry.